Rick Schmid is here to share his extensive knowledge of how to design your backyard as a bird watching oasis. Rick, and I can attest to this, has been a bird nut nearly all his life. With over 50 years birding experience and 25 years bird banding experience. He currently operates a banding station on Carpenter Nature Center's Wisconsin property. If you need to find that, contact me in the chat. I'll give you directions and all that. It's beautiful. Um, he is a native of, na of Nebraska, but after retiring three years ago, he and his wife moved to their home in Stillwater, Minnesota. Rick has three children, two stepchildren, six grandchildren, 1,025 life birds, and a really cute dog. I'm going to throw that in there for you, Rick. And Thank a you. bird watching haven in his backyard. So without much further ado, take it away, Rick. All right. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're doing well. Um, unfortunately, my backyard bird haven took a beating in this storm. We have an extensive number of branches down that's going to require quite a bit of cleanup. So, hope, so fortunately, all the photos were taken before today, everything that I'm going to show you today. So um, when people think about attracting birds to their yard, um, usually they think about bird feeders. But I'm going to take us back here to our second grade uh, science class and, and say that uh, Really, I think attracting birds to your backyard uh, involves creating a habitat for the birds, which is more than food. And as you remember from, from grade school, a habitat includes water, food, shelter, air, and air or space. And I think in order to attract the maximum number of birds to your yard, you wanna, you wanna cover all four of those. And um, so I'm gonna talk about water first because I think it might be the most important because you can attract birds to your yard with water that you normally wouldn't um, attract with bird with a bird feeder. So for example, we have here uh, bathing in our stream in our backyard. There's two chestnut sided warblers on the on the left side and then there's a scarlet tanager on the right. And those are birds that probably wouldn't normally uh, wouldn't normally come to uh, a feeder, but they'll they'll come to the water. And when you're providing water, I think one of the most important things is to have sound. And I don't know if, I don't know if the sound is coming through on that, but that's our waterfall. Uh, that's in our water feature at our house. Uh, and if you can't hear it, at least you can see that the water's falling over the rocks. And we were really fortunate that when we bought the house that we had a, a fairly extensive water feature. And the sound is really important, I think, because uh, the birds will be attracted to that first. You know, they're gonna be way up high in the canopy migrating or, or looking for food or nesting, whatever they're doing in your yard. And if you have some noise of the water, it will attract them. And if you, if you can't, uh, you know, can't, um, manage to get a waterfall installed, there are a lot of things that will work. You can use aerators, you can use bubblers. Uh, I've got a friend who just has a hose that drips in a bucket, just one drip every few seconds. And any kind of any kind of noise that that water will make um, uh, will be will be helpful. So uh, the way our uh, water feature works, the, the waterfall that you see on the left is actually to the right of my wife there, if you're trying to put things in perspective. So the waterfall falls down as, as you can see, and then it runs into the stream uh, that kind of snakes its way down to the pond. And if you look kind of in the center of the picture and towards the back, you can see there's a, a little wooden bridge and there's a, um, a big um, water lily, a big um, plant in the water. There's a lot of duckweed on our pond at the day that this picture was taken. And obviously this picture was not taken recently. But one of the things you'll notice is that the stream winds down there and there is vegetation around our, around our water feature, but it's, I, I keep it trimmed back. And the reason that, we, that I do that is because birds are vulnerable uh, when they're bathing. And so what they want is they want, um, they want to be in the open so that nobody can sneak up on them, but then they also want to have cover nearby that they can get to quickly Get, get to it quickly if uh, if they're disturbed by something because they're they're very vulnerable when they're bathing. So uh, here you see on the on the left you can see that there's a yellow warbler bathing in our stream, and he's in the open. But if you look, there are some fuzzy leaves, <laughs> out of focus leaves above him and below him, and what that indicates is that there's a bush nearby. So if something uh, scares him or or if he perceives danger somewhere, he can get into that bush really quickly. And then the Tennessee warbler uh, on the right is actually pretty well camouflaged by the rocks. And, um, you know, if something came at him, there, there are plants nearby him too, but he could get down into the rocks or maybe even freeze against the uh, rocks and be and pretty be pretty well camouflaged. So, um, so it's important to have cover nearby 
Um, but it's also uh, important that there be some sort of an open area uh, so that the birds um, can't can't have a predator sneak up on them. So um, I I just found out a few weeks ago or a month or so ago that I was going to be going to be doing this presentation. So um, I wasn't able to get all of the photos that I wanted. So what I'm going to show you now is what's called an artist rendition. And this is something I put together, uh, put together myself. I, I was hoping to get a photo of, of what we have in our yard, but the time of year didn't didn't lend itself to that. So I'm going to talk about something that um, I call um, a water avenue, and that's just I think a word I made up um, to to describe the path that a bird needs to get down to the water. Because most likely, if a bird comes into your yard and sees that there's a water feature, it's not necessarily going to just jump right in the water because they're very leery about, you know, safety. So most likely birds are going to come into your yard up high in the tree canopy. If, if you have a tree canopy, they're going to come in, you know, at a higher level. And you can see those branches in the upper right-hand corner of the picture. And you can see a couple of cardinals sitting in there, just kind of looking down at the water. And that's, that's what the birds do in our yard anyway. They sit up in the high branches and they kind of look down for a little bit. And then we have a, we have a tree that uh, is very, it looks very close to the, the one that's drawn in the center of the drawing there. Um, it's a locust tree, but our tree is dead. And everybody comes to our house and says, why don't you cut that tree down? And I said, well, that's part of my water avenue for the birds. So the birds start up high and then they move down into that tree. And then they kind of check things out and they bounce around back and forth. And then eventually when they feel that things are safe, they'll move down into the elderberry bushes um, that are around our water feature. And you can see there's a cardinal kind of peeking out from behind the leaf in the elderberry. And then eventually, once they think things are safe, they'll move down to the water. And you can see way down over on the left, there's a cardinal sitting on what's supposed to be a rock, uh, getting ready to jump in and take a bath. So um, the idea is that you just kind of provide them a ladder to come down to the water so that they are doing this in a way that, that they're comfortable. Uh, and we really like the elderberry bushes, um, just as kind of a side comment. The elderberry bushes are not densely, they don't have a lot of dense foliage but the leaves are really big. So you can have a bird like a warbler that can get in that elderberry bush and literally hide behind a leaf and you can't even tell it's there. Uh, but yet it's not so densely vegetated that a cat or a, a, you know, a snake or something could be in it and the bird not see it. So we, we use elderberry bushes around our, um, around our water feature in the areas where the birds bathe. Okay. And then of course, um, our pond only runs from, yeah, my goal every year is to get our pond running by April 1st. And that didn't happen today for obvious reasons. Uh, but sometime in the next two or three weeks, I'm hoping that I'll be able to get our pond and our stream running. And we usually run it from sometime in April until sometime in, uh, usually around November 1st. And I, I have not yet experimented with putting a bubbler in it. I think that's something I'm going to do maybe next winter. But what I do is I, in the winter, when I shut the pond down is I offer water on our deck and I just do that with a, a heated bird bath like this one, with this one actually, <laughs> that, that is our bird bath on our deck. Um, these are, are very safe. Uh, you don't have, you don't necessarily have to keep them full of water. If they run out of water, they'll, they're still just fine. I just leave it plugged in all the time and um, I end up filling it most every day. A lot of water gets lost to evaporation, especially when it's dry in the winter, but um, the birds do use this uh, and the squirrels also use it um, in the winter. So um, that's water. We're gonna talk a little bit about food. I'm, I've, I've done entire presentations on feeding birds and attracting birds and what kind of seed, what birds eat. But in the interest of time, uh, what I'm gonna do today is just talk a little bit, um, very little about bird feeding, about the actual feeders. And um, this picture was taken uh, just a few weeks ago. And the I, I I know that you can't see what all the feeders are and that's okay. The purpose of this picture was just to illustrate that what I have found in my personal experience is the best way to keep squirrels, um, the best way to keep squirrels off of your bird feeders is with shepherd's hooks and baffles. That That is the thing um, that I use for pretty much all of my feeders. I've, I only have nine feeders out right now. I have enough space and places to have 19. But for some reason, it just seemed like there weren't very many birds around this winter. And, and I ended up not even filling my feeders that often and, and not having out as many as I usually do. Um, the there I, You probably can't see this, but on the third uh, shepherd's hook from the left, there's a feeder hanging there that's got a cage around it. It's like a tube feeder with a cage. 
And I use those pretty extensively in, in Nebraska to keep squirrels and grackles and um, starlings out of the feeders. And, and they're good for that, except here in Minnesota, we have the red squirrel and the red squirrel can actually get in those cages. I was really surprised one day when I had that feeder in an area, a place that it wasn't baffled. And I looked out one day and there was a red squirrel inside the cage. So even though the, the, the feeder is in a cage to keep out most things, um, uh, I still have it on a baffled shepherd's hook because, uh, because of the red squirrel. When you're feeding birds, one thing that is kind of important to mention is that you should not put out more food than they can eat in a day or two. And that's especially true uh, when the weather is warm and humid or warm and wet, or if there's any kind of rain, any kind of precipitation. Um, if food stays out too long, it, you know, it goes bad. In the winter, when it's cool and dry, I think you can probably get by maybe, you know, in the three to four to five day range, leaving food out. But uh, after that, you want to uh, you want to make sure that you're replacing the food o or not just what I do is I don't put out any more than they can eat, you know, in a couple of days. So don't fill them all the way to the top if they're not emptying them. You know, of course, you need to make sure your feeders are kept clean. And then uh, you all, the other thing is you want to avoid using metal on your feeders in the winter because especially if you're offering water, offering a heated bird bath, because um, if birds are wet from drinking or bathing and they get to a metal feeder, it's possible to have uh, feathers, feet, eyeballs, bills, feet, feet freeze to the feeders. And that can happen very quickly. And it's uh, it's kind of a mess. So you, you kind of want to stay away from bare metal, any bare metal in your feeders, especially in the winter. So um, just one more slide on food. Um, if you're uh, if you're just starting with bird feeding, if you are only going to put out one feeder, what I would recommend is black oil sunflower. I, it just seems like that's a, preferred by most birds. Almost all birds will eat it. So if I were only going to have one feeder, I would I would have black oil sunflower. If I were going to add a second feeder, then I would add peanut do peanut butter. And then if I were going to put a third feeder out, I'd do finch mix and so on down the line. And and you can read those um, those things. Uh, if you're going to do peanuts either in the shell or out of the shell, uh, make sure they're unsalted. You should never feed salted food to birds. Um, I don't feed in shell peanuts anymore because I did I did for a while because I really like the blue jays and the blue jays come and get them. But I find uh, peanuts all over my yard, all over my roof, all over my gutters. I don't know if they ever eat them or if they, if they just uh, if they just carry them away and hide them. And the crazy thing is, if you fill up a peanut feeder with peanuts in the shell. The first blue jay that comes in will pick up every one of those peanuts and shake it in his bill and take the one that he likes best, which is crazy because you know that he's going to come back and get all the rest of them anyway. But it's always it's always interesting to me to watch how they pick the first one that they want. Um, uh, the other thing I would say about black oil sunflower, um, if you're feeding black oil sunflower, um, it's it's one of the less expensive foods you can buy that the birds will will really eat. But uh, if you buy it all in in the shell, then they'll make a real mess on the ground, um, cracking the seeds open, and uh, really damages your landscape. If you buy um, hearts, which are bla black oil sunflower that's already cracked open and doesn't have any shells, uh, it's really clean for your yard, but it will damage your bank account. So what I found is a really cool compromise, and I'm just going to put in a plug here for Atlas Pets. There's an Atlas Pet store in, I think there's one in Blaine and there's one in Stillwater. And they sell something in 50 pound bags and smaller that they call coarse sunflower. And the 50 pound bag is about $52. So it's it's more than just buying black oil seed, but it's a lot less expensive than buying the stuff that's already shelled. And it's a pretty nice compromise. So anyway, uh, that's what I've got about food. Um, uh, oh, except in the warm weather, Here's a couple of things that you can do in the warm weather. Uh, if you want to try to attract uh, Orioles to your yard, there's a couple of, or there's a pair of orchard Orioles um, on the left and they're eating great jelly. Uh, you can also feed oranges. There's some metal pins in the middle of that feeder that you can put orange halves on. My experience is that the birds like the grape jelly better than the oranges. And then for hummingbirds, you um, want to have sugar water. And I just, um, if you're going to do sugar water, don't don't use any kind of colored water. Just use regular water and sugar. I use uh, one part sugar to four parts water, and I don't boil mine. I just mix it up. And I just actually what I do is I just take a quarter cup, quarter cup of sugar, and then a cup of water, and just make a small amount. 
and then you you know put that in the feeders i don't fill the feeders all the way up because they don't empty it at my place um and, and again just like i said with the other food you don't want that sugar water sitting out there too long especially if it's warm outside because it will it will go bad okay um so we talked about water we talked about food we'll talk a little bit about shelter and there's two ways to provide shelter um, one is to build houses and uh, i have bluebird um bluebird boxes in my yard they're in the picture on the left uh, and you can see that I have them on a pole and I have them baffled just to keep snakes and, and, um, squirrels and things out of the, out of the house and, and keep them from bothering the birds. And I made both of those bluebird houses. I just Googled bluebird house plans and I found them the online, the simplest plan I could find. And they weren't very difficult to make. I do bring them in during the winter and I clean them up and paint them if they need to be painted and, uh, clean them out. And the same with the house wren and black cap chickadee houses. I, I built those just off a simple plan off the internet and I just hang them in trees in our yard. So um, the other way is to provide, the other way to provide uh, shelter is to provide a natural shelter or natural habitat for the birds. And, and this is not only for shelter, but also for food. And as we'll see in a minute, maybe also for water. And so one of the things uh, we've been doing at, at our place, which we affectionately call um, Schmidt Acre, <laughs> We have about one acre. Uh, is we um, we have been replacing. We've been taking invasives out and trying to replace those with native plants. So, at the top of our driveway, right by our road, when we moved into the house uh, almost four years ago, this is what it looked like. And all of that vegetation that you see, all of the green stuff, is buckthorn, and the uh, the trunks of the bigger trees, those are elm trees. So I have been. I, I have now think I can say I've removed all of the buckthorn from our property. Uh, and that area now looks like that. So we turned that area into what we call our um, woodland garden. And I was absolutely amazed. I started removing buckthorn in this area in the fall, the first fall that we moved here in uh, September of 2019. And uh, I got about half of the area done and then I finished it in, in the next spring. And I was absolutely shocked that when I went out there to work in the spring, the area where I had removed the buckthorn from the previous fall, we already had native plants coming back. We had Solomon seal and we had motherwort and a lot of jewel weed, or I think you call it touch me not up here. Um, and um, I was just shocked at how quickly the natives came back. And so uh, the guard on the picture on the right, it looks even, I mean, it's a little more filled in now than it was when I took that picture some time ago, but we've got some, we've got some naturally occurring natives in there. And then we've also been planting wild geranium and, um, wild ginger and some other things in there um, to, to keep the native plants uh, going. Um, and then just a couple other quick ideas, um, uh, other landscaping ideas. These are a couple other things we've done. On the left, we have what we call our sewer garden. And shortly after we uh, moved in, we had to have our septic system replaced. And you can see that there are some uh, like manhole covers, some uh, gray looking ovals on the ground there. And that's where our septic tanks are. And so we wanted to keep that area open and accessible for maintenance reasons. We didn't, you know, we didn't want to have um, have a lot of uh, perennials or permanent plants planted there because um, people, you know, you have to kind of have to have, have to have the septic system pumped. So we use that for annuals mostly. Um, we, what you see there is mostly zinnias and marigolds. And um, we also have some cardinal flower that showed up there. Uh, I think maybe my wife planted that. My wife is the gardener. I'm not. Uh, and I think she planted it, and it's really beautiful. And that one is a perennial. It is coming back every year. And then on the right, uh, you'll see uh, our rain garden. And when they did our septic system, they regraded our whole yard, and they left uh, a really low spot in the middle of our front yard. And every time it rains and every time the snow melts, we have a pond there that we don't really want. So what I did is I turned it into a rain garden. And uh, again, I just I looked online, you know, the easy ways to make a rain garden. And um, it, it, was, it was fairly simple to do. Um, and we put uh, uh, pollinators mostly, pollinator plants and wetland plants in there. We have some blue flag and we have some wetland sedges in there. Um, and we also have uh, on the, around the, the center of the rain garden is where all the water uh, filters to. And then around the outside of it, we have some higher areas and I've been able to get um, swamp milkweed and butterfly milkweed to grow in that area, so. So anyway, uh, those are just a couple other ideas of things you can do in your yard that create good 
habitat for birds and for insects. And of course, if you're creating habitat for insects, you're also creating habitat for birds because the birds need the insects. So, so those are just a couple ideas of some things we did here at Schmedig. All right, there you go. You got any questions, Jen? Um, I do. There are a couple of questions in the chat. The first one is very important when we think of chronic wasting disease and um, some of the rules around feeding deer in our region. They want to know how you keep the deer from eating at your feeders. The deer really can't. The deer really can't eat out of most of the feeders because, um, like finch, they can't get into a finch feeder, and they can't really get into um, my suet feeders. And some of my feeders are up high enough that I'm not even sure a deer could reach them because I've had to go up higher to <laughs> keep the squirrels from jumping over the baffles. And we also don't have a ton of deer in our neighborhood. We do have them occasionally and occasionally in our yard. And the other thing that um, last winter I was ground feeding and that brought deer into our yard. I had an actual, I put a lot of seed on the ground and I had a feeder that I put corn in like a ground feeder. And I didn't do that this winter. So that's another thing you can do is not ground feed. And then the other thing you could do is clean up under the feeders too. Fantastic. All right, so we've got some other good questions here. How do you set up the peanut butter for the birds? Is there a specific peanut butter feeder? I make my own. Uh, what I do, and I'm sorry, I don't have a, a better picture of this, but I take I take a log and split it in half because I'm I've split firewood anyway. So you take half a log and then flip it over and drill holes in it with a spade bit, you know, a, a fairly wide bit, and then flip it back over and put two little screw hooks, uh, screw eyes in in it, and just put a piece of wire over it. Really super simple. You can do it in a matter of minutes. And then you hang that up, and then you just put the peanut butter. Uh, just smear the peanut butter into the holes underneath, so that the peanut butter actually is is underneath, and that will keep keep starlings off of it. They can still fly under it and pick at it, but they can't sit on it underneath and eat. But all the woodpeckers and chickadees and, and nuthatches can. So I make my own peanut butter feeders: half a log, holes holes on the flat side, turn it over and hang it up. Maybe that's a future money making endeavor for you in your retirement. <laughs> yeah. Um, the next question is uh, what is your preferred method to remove buckthorn? Dig it. Dig it? Yeah. There's yeah, also don't, that, that cut don't, waste, it. don't waste your time cutting it. <laughs> it just grows <laughs> back. And and buckthorn, buckthorn doesn't have a tap root. So it comes the trunk comes down and then it splits out like this. So if you if you can get a shovel, even a fairly good sized sapling, if you can get a shovel under it and pry down and push, it'll come out. But I've I've done all of it is I've either if it's really small I pull it, and if it's bigger I dig it, and if it's really big I cut it off and then I treat the stump with something to kill it. And but you'd be surprised at how big of a buckthorn tree you can dig out. Yeah, girdling them takes a long time. There is a really good article I believe it's on Minnesota Naturalist Facebook group all about the latest on. Um, out competing them with good native planting and things like that. So um, we'll try to get that link up there for y'all. Um, Claudia would like to know how about using safflower seed? And Ben has made a comment that golden safflower is a favorite for the house and goldfinches in his area. Do you have any comments on that one? I'm not, I don't have anything against safflower. I don't feed safflower because I don't know. Personally, I haven't ever observed any bird that eats safflower that won't eat something else. And a lot of people say, well, grackles won't eat safflower, and I have not found that to be true. So I, I don't feed safflower just because I, I don't think it, it adds any value to the birds that are coming to my yard. If you have different birds, and I have house finches, and they, they eat on my finch feeders, and they eat um, black oil sunflower. Okay, just uh, two more, it looks like, or maybe even one more. Um, two more. What do you do to make good habitat for insects that are beneficial to birds? We've been planting um, native, native uh, plants and pollinator plants. So we've planted the, the gardens that I showed you aren't, aren't nearly all the gardens that my wife has. We have gardens all around our house that she's been planting. Um, um, echinacea. What, uh, um, coneflower. Coneflower. Thank you. She's been planting coneflower and um, and and milkweed and uh, black-eyed susans, and so we've just tried really been trying to plant um, things that will plant plants that will attract 
insects. Right. Um, Dennis would like to know if you have raccoons. We have only ever had one raccoon in our in our yard that I know of, and um, it did not look very well. And I would be surprised if it survived. Right. And then uh, let's see, somebody said ditto on the golden safflower. And then um, Bill Marengo said for buckthorn, they use the weed wrench. Um, regardless, buckthorn removal is a lot of work. And there's great, um, just from a side note, your uh, conservation districts and water management districts often have um, resources for um, helping you with that as well. 